welcome to grab the md be sure to subscribe give a thumbs up and spread the word so now that we know about frank starling mechanism and some of the high yield concepts in cardiovascular physiology let's talk about the starling curve it's a graph that depicts the relationship between end diastolic volume or preload and stroke volume or cardiac output Remember, end diastolic volume gives us preload, so these two can be used interchangeably here. Similarly, stroke volume gives us cardiac output, so we can use either of them here. Alright, now the graph. The curve looks something like this. Let's pick a hypothetical point on this curve and label it N. Let's say this point shows the stroke volume or cardiac output of a normal healthy person under normal conditions for a given amount of preload. As per the graph, we can change these conditions. Let's say we increase preload by putting more blood into the heart. So what's the effect? Increased cardiac output. So increasing preload increases cardiac output. For example, giving someone normal sedine. Similarly, if we decrease preload, we decrease the cardiac output. We decrease preload by dilating the veins, for example using nitroglycerin. But that's not the only way we can change the Starling curve. We can move the curve up or down by changing some other factors. For example, if we increase contractility, we get a new curve which is higher up. Contractility is increased by catecholamines, for example, epinephrine. The same is also true about decreasing the afterload. When we decrease the afterload, the curve shifts up and the cardiac output increases. We dilate the arteries using hydralazine to reduce the afterload or resistance to blood flow. Exercise changes both of them. It increases contractility and decreases the afterload by dilating the arteries feeding the muscles. So exercise, epinephrine and hydralazine all shift the curve up such that cardiac output is increased at all points along the curve compared to normal for the same amount of preload. Let's draw the curve one more time to see what happens if we change things the other way around. For example, decreasing contractility seen in myocardial infarction or heart failure or when using beta blockers and the calcium channel blockers rapamil to tyrosine, or increasing the afterload such as in hypertension or aortic stenosis. These two changes shift the curve down. On this new curve, cardiac output is reduced compared to normal curve for the same amount of preload. So if heart failure shifts the curve down, what happens if we give them digoxin? Digoxin improves contractility and shifts the heart failure curve up but still below the normal curve because digoxin does not restore the heart back to normal. So the Starling curve tells us two things. If we put more blood into the heart, it pumps out more blood. If we increase force of contraction or decrease resistance to blood flow, aka decrease the afterload, the curve is shifted upwards, meaning the heart is pumping out more blood. The opposite is also true. Decreasing the preload means less blood in, so less blood will be pumped out. With weak contraction or increased afterload, the curve is shifted downwards, meaning less blood pumped out. So that pretty much sums up the stalling curve. I know it can be difficult to grasp, so you might want to watch it again. And I will see you in the next video, so be sure to subscribe to stay updated.